Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution? Or perhaps for emotional healing? Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on Eros Evolution on Om Times Radio. Hello, hello, and welcome to Eros Evolution. This is where sexuality and spirituality meet. My name is Martha. I'm a sexologist, and I'm from Eros Coaching. That's E-R-O-S Coaching.com. What I do is I work with individuals, couples, uh, people of all genders, nationality, race, and uh, we talk about anything that they want to talk about when it comes to sexuality. And uh, in this show, we always talk about the link between sexuality and spirituality. Today's show, I have my new friend in Singapore, Priest Scott Gaylord, and uh, he is an improv expert. He's the former artistic director of the Baltimore Improv Group and creator of the four, that's the number four, four play sex and comedy show, which is a live show in Baltimore and Singapore with a podcast following. On this show, he hosts sex experts, artists, educators, and sexuality thinkers, and invites them to talk about various subjects on uh, with comedians. He has directed large and small-scale improvised projects in several cities, including Skinnerstasia, Body Painted Improv, that's one of his shows, Im- Improvised Burlesque, and Unscripted. Sounds fun. Uh, and um, Unscripted is an improvised play in two acts. And this show has uh, enjoyed sold-out runs in Baltimore over the past seven years. He has performed in and directed shows in improv festivals in Baltimore, Shanghai, Philadelphia, Pens- Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., Austin, New York, and Chicago. And you can find him on his website, that's the 4playsexcomedy.com, and on Facebook, 4playsexcomedy. That's 4, the number 4, and then playsexcomedy.com. And in today's show, we'll be talking about how he, uh, in his work, comedian and host the 4Play Sex and Comedy Show, Priest Scott Gaylord will talk about the intersection of humor and sex education. He believes that sex education is frequently delivered so seriously that we forget the fun in the pleasure. And uh, he will be discussing with us why comedians should get sex information correct and why sex educators should immediately right, enroll thanks. in an off class. So welcome, Priest Scott. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you managed to get connected. Um, yeah, there were some tech uh, things happening just now. So, yes, I just introduced you and talked about what we're going to be talking about in today's show. I'm very interested to know how did you get into improv? Improv is hard. I don't know that. It, yeah, I mean, improv is like anything that takes practice. Um you know, which is you, you you do it for a while. I think a lot of people can do improv. I think most people could do improv once they start and start practicing for a while. I got into it because I, I showed up to an audition from a listing that said no experience necessary. And I uh, always mm-hmm. had wanted to try it. So, so I just showed up in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, started to take classes and started performing probably six months after that. Mhm. And was it easy or like why did you keep at it? Well, I kept at it because it's amazing. Uh the first <laughs> you know, it's I I didn't say I was amazing. Improv is amazing. Kind of the the first uh I mean like that first 6 months that you do it is yeah. quite amazing for a lot of people and it was for me, right? So the you know going from zero to zero to one is is such a intoxicating jump when you do improv, learning the basic theories of uh, you know basic acceptance and uh, and moving on and you know being able to start scenes uh, is is quite intoxicating when you first start. 
So it's pretty easy to, to keep at it when you're first starting. Okay. It sounds like what happens during the honeymoon period. Does this high continue? Yeah. The high does continue because you you know you you get you get other highs you you do other things you learn other lessons, um, and that's why you know I read a I read a satire article about uh, improv once, um, which basically just described true things that people do. Uh, I think it was an Onion article if you know that uh, if you know that satire magazine it said a uh, person likes improv. So much he he decided to start training corporations using the same theories, uh, which is funny. But people actually do that. Uh, and the, my opinion is it is because it's amazing for long enough that you think you can apply these theories to anything. And so a lot of people who start improv do things like they become corporate trainers or they become uh, they do this thing called applied improv where they. They apply the basic theories of improv training to other parts of life, team building, management, uh, and everything else. And it was a satire article, but also lots of people do actually do this. It, it was actually just true. Um, and the the reason is it feels good for a long time. And the same thing that helps you make good scenes or make funny scenes actually helps you it can help you do a lot of things and uh and when i realized it helps in sex education is when i uh when i started to create the foreplay show hmm. tell us um was um i i suppose the foreplay show is um how you went from improv uh into sex education so what made you decide to do this show? Yes. Uh, so I, I happen to have a friend whose name is Jack Jones, uh, who did sex education. Uh, Jack owns the shop in Baltimore, Maryland called Sugar and does uh, a good amount of sex education there in that shop. And I just asked if she wanted to do a show with me so that we would have a bona fide sex educator along with comedians. And we, the idea was to get the sex education correct um, and to make sure there was good sex education and good comedy and we would discuss one topic every month and do a show on it. And that is what we did. So uh, I brought the comedians and she brought the educators and sex experts and we made a show. How long how long were you doing this show? Or have you been doing this show? Sorry. It has been uh, it's been about two years. Wow. Maybe just over two years. Yeah. Mm, okay. And why sex? Is, yes. Se why sex? Is that does that ever need to be asked? I mean, sex. <laughs> Uh, sex is funny. I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, when we started it, there was a, there was a little bit of a desire to, to do the sex education, but there was a lot of desire to sell tickets. Mm. And I thought the sex, I thought talking about the sex would actually sell the tickets along with the comedy. I tried to really think ah. of my favorite things and, uh, yeah, you know, sex laughing and sex were up there. <laughs> So I mm. thought, uh, yeah, exactly. So I thought the sex and comedy would just be a great way to sell tickets. But several so months in, I realized, oh, yes, this is always a live show. It was a live show uh, long before we made it a podcast. Mm. Okay. Yeah, you were saying? Well, I realized after we did the show for several months, I started to be known a little bit as a uh, uh, as someone who did a sex education show. And so, you know, friends and acquaintances and strangers started to ask me about various sex topics mm -hmm. that I didn't know anything about. 
and people got tired of, uh, you know, me telling them, no, no, I'm not really a sex educator. I just sit near them and make butt jokes. So I actually started to educate myself a little bit, which is pretty easy. I was now sitting every month with top of the line sex educators in the U S. So I started to learn, started to teach myself some of the, uh, some of the actual sex education so that I could at least point people to the correct resources. And then I realized how important all that was. That's really great. So the comedian gets educated. Exactly. And I can see how people would be comfortable speaking with you because you're, you know, you have a very nice face, you are very approachable, and uh, you, you would talk about things in a more lighthearted way. Yes. Sorry, I'm coughing. I'm trying to hit my cough switch. <laughs> and, you know, I missed the joke about you saying I had a nice face. Because I was coughing too much. So I apologize for that. Uh, I, uh, but thank you for saying I had a nice face. Well, yeah, I think it's true. You, I think sometimes <laughs> knowing that you're talking to a sex educator can be intimidating for some people. So they rather talk to the person who's connected to the sex educator. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um yeah, it was probably a little easier to talk to me for a little while because I was the guy mostly playing the the classic straight man on the show, asking the questions, kind of being the voice of the audience for the show. And it, it probably made me a little bit more approachable for a while. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about what happened uh, to Priest God after a while, after this break. All right. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hi. I'm Kelly Fox, host and astrologer of The Astrology Show. Each week, I'll give you access to the current transits, which are a valuable tool that provide astrological information to help unlock the potential each of us has. Understanding the stars can help steer us in the right direction to make better informed choices. So if you're wondering what's going to happen in your week ahead, be sure to tune in to The Astrology Show for guidance. Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Every two minutes, an American is sexually assaulted. The majority of victims know their attacker. It could be your friend, your neighbor, or someone you met at a party. If you said no, it's rape, and it's a crime. This is Christina Ricci with RAIN. Call the National Sexual Assault Hotline today at 1-800-656-HOPE or visit RAIN.org. That's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by Rain and this station. Welcome back to Eros Evolution. This is where sexuality and spirituality meets. We're talking about sex meets comedy and comedy meets sex with Priest Scott Gaylord today. And uh, he's improv comedian and host of the four, that's the number four, play, sex and comedy show. And it is based in Baltimore and now also in Singapore. It has a podcast following and it uh, is also a live show. And so we're talking to him just now, just before the break, about how he got into improv and how he started his show where he began to transition into combining sex and comedy 
and uh, therefore by by default um, sex education. And um, so, um, so please, Scott. Yes, I am here. Hi. Yes, good. So I wanted to ask you, um, sex education would uh, involve some very heavy topics like uh, consent and assault. So it's uh, sometimes very much politically charged as well, very sensitive and uh, kind of triggering. So how do you actually make make, make um, the discussions that you have in your shows when your role there uh, is also to be funny? Yeah, this was one of the prime concerns that we had when we started the show and probably was the topic that we spoke most about when we first started, which is if you have comedians near these heavy topics, how do you make sure uh, that people's that feelings are honored and, and that everything is going in the right direction? And we've actually found that it, we, we probably didn't need to worry as much as we did at the, before every show, we actually discuss things with the comedians and with the sex educators about what's, you know, what's within limits and what's off limits. Um, and that, it, you know, we don't allow making fun of uh, people's sexual practices. We don't make fun of people in general. We make, we can make fun of topics and we can make fun of ourselves. Um, but mostly, you know, a whole lot of comedy is very positive in what we call punching up. And uh, it, it makes it still makes for a very good show. Even with that, you know, with these very difficult topics that are triggering for people, it, what I find is comedians are actually very astute when it comes to uh, when the moment is, it's necessary in the moment that, to just listen and give ground and just honor what somebody is saying uh, and when it's time to make comments. So what we found is, especially improv comedians, but also with some of the stand-ups that we've had, they've actually been very good at this. So when somebody is saying something difficult or talking about something very difficult, whether they're a survivor, whether they're a person just asking an earnest question uh, to, you know, just to honor what they are doing and to, and to support the fact that they're asking the question. The comedians have been very good at saying, you know, wonderful for you to ask. Um, and then we make, you know, fart jokes at other times. Mm. It sounds like um, your comedians would be sensitive to what the situation called for and um, the ability to think on their feet uh, without losing their heart uh, help the situation. Yes. Um, I think people have this, this feeling that comedians are completely heartless and will always go for a joke. And what we've found is that doesn't make for a very good comedian. Comedians mm. mostly are very good at listening and observing what is, what is going on at the current moment. Mm. So, it's, you know, especially people trained in improv. If you train in improv for any number of years, you have to be listening, you know, every second for what is going on right now and not to what's in your head. So, because you need to be able to react you know, in the current moment for what's appropriate. So if what's appropriate is to sit and listen and to let somebody give their story, then uh, comedians and notably improv comedians can do that very easily. And uh, the feedback we've gotten almost universally uh, is how wonderful and empowering it all is. Mm. That's pretty awesome, you know, that uh, you were able to do that in Baltimore. How about in Singapore, now that you've moved here for the last three months? Yeah, well, we've had some, we haven't done a full show here yet. But what we have done is uh, we've gotten snippets 
you know, little interviews with people and the person on the street videos of people in Singapore um, where we've asked those questions. And what I've personally found is, you know, the ideas and experiences are pretty universal. So I think we're going to be able to, to put on the show quite well here. And I've landed in a great community, both of uh, sex educators, where I met you, and of comedians, where I've met a good number of people, such that there's, you know, there's great pockets of both here in Singapore. Mm. Yeah, as a Singaporean, I'm pretty skeptical of uh, anybody who is trying to get out of the norm. Um, There's a lot of um, pressure to conform and um, just keep your head low and try to earn as much money as you can. So what are the people uh, who do improv in Singapore like compared to, say, uh, where you're from, uh, Baltimore? Pretty similar, actually. Um, okay. And Singapore is, a, Singapore is a much bigger city than Baltimore is. Uh, and also, there's more media outlets in Singapore. So there's there's a bigger talent pool. And there is um, there's a there's a little bit of a difference in in Baltimore. Nobody is going to show up to your show in Baltimore. Uh, who's like the producer of a of a TV show, for example. But in Singapore, mm-hmm. you, you might find that there are producers of TV shows here who produce in Singapore, who might who might show up at your show. So there's a little so there's a little bit of a talent pool who are training for bigger and better entertainment things here in Singapore. I think in Baltimore, mm-hmm. you know, there's a population of improvisers who are a lot like me, who had day jobs doing other things who were just doing improv and comedy in general for the love of it, not really thinking there was much of a future for it, just continuing and, you know, loving the journey. And then there are, you know, there are what, what I like to call the, the younger generation of improvisers in Baltimore um, who were training and were waiting to, to do bigger and better entertainment things. But the general feeling is that they would have to move out of Baltimore to do it. So they were training for a while, and then a lot of them moved out. Here in Singapore, those two populations are all kind of mixed, right? There's nowhere. I mean, maybe somebody is going to move out of here into, you know, Los Angeles or London or or somewhere, uh, maybe Hong Kong. But probably not. They're probably going to stay here. So there's a plenty big population of people who are on TV or working for, you know, Singapore TV, looking to do movies and theater, et cetera, and just live here and are, and are doing that. So mm-hmm. it's a little bit of a different population because not as many people are trying to move out of Singapore to make it an entertainment because you can do it here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, even though uh, Singapore is small, we now have 5 million people. And uh, we are at the crossroads of um, many cities, and it's a very good uh, place to be based so that you can travel from around the world. So I can see uh, where you're coming from, from from that. Even though as Singaporean um, myself, we tend to be quite skeptical of Singapore. Um, do, do you feel that uh, people who do improvisation would make good lovers? Because... Uh, part of being able to have good sex, I feel, is just being in the moment and going with the flow of things. And um, I suppose that that would be a skill that people who do improvisation have. What do you think about that? Yeah, I actually think that improvisers make the best lovers. And uh, <laughs> you should tell as many people as possible that one <laughs> sentence. No, we, so, yeah, I was discussing this with, with Jack Jones, and she noted that the more she learned about improv, she said, you know, this, this is all the same skill set that we teach for good sex. And I said, yes, this is what I've been trying to tell you. 
This is exactly right. Uh, you know, sex is not that different than a comedy scene or an improvised scene in general. Sometimes it's a comedy scene. Sometimes it's a passionate scene. Sometimes it's a serious scene. Um, sometimes it's a dramatic scene. Uh, but sex is the same, which is in general, unless you're role playing or, or whatever, it is not a scripted scene. And the, the, there are wonderful skills in improv that allow you to listen to, you know, what your partner or partners are telling you, um, by their, by their body language, by their moaning, by what they're saying, by what they look like they're enjoying and what they're not enjoying and responding to that, you know, the whole basis of improv that we, you know, we call it yes. And yes, being mm -hmm. acceptance of everything that's going on, every, you know, everything is great and is working and being, okay, here's another piece of something for us to deal with. That makes for wonderful sex, right? Yes. Everything you're giving me is wonderful. Let me honor that. And Here's another thing for us to be doing. So this, you know, sex is improv. So anytime you can train on those skills in one or the other, it makes you better at the other thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, um, I can see... Um, the link between the two, and I definitely feel that um, not being in our heads and being in the moment, being in our bodies can really help us to be better lovers. I think that is actually very challenging for a lot of um, um, people that ha I have come across um, because they want to be good. They want to be good, and then they plan in their heads, okay, I'm going to do this 10-step thing. After about two minutes, I'm going to switch position. And um, that really takes away from um, being emotionally connected with the partners. So what you were saying just now about really listening um, and not assuming uh, really uh, is relevant there. Uh, we have a break and uh, after this break, we'll come back uh, with uh, Peace God a lot and we'll talk more about improv and comedy. And sex. And sex. <laughs> Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hi, this is Julie Geigel. And I'm Susan Schuler. And I'm Carrie Ann Larson. And we are the Psychic Angel Channelers from Angel Talk Tuesday. Tune in every week at 10 a.m. Eastern on OwnTimesRadio.com. The angels have heard your call and are here to help. Are you ready to receive? They in a beautiful vibrational frequency to help you heal, expand, and remember your magnificence with Angel Talk Tuesday. There is no death, only a change of worlds. Chief Seattle. Deborah Livingston is an award-winning intuitive psychic medium whose international services include mediumship, spiritual assessment, animal communication, and spiritual mentoring. She is a published author and a trained shaman. Deborah provides evidential messages from spirit and departed loved ones. Learn more at devlivemedium.com. That's D-E-B-L-I-V medium.com. What's up? This is Brad and Mike from Lincoln Park for Life Beat, the music industry fights AIDS. Listen up, times are tough and you get a lot of things thrown your way. If you're being pressured to have sex and you're not ready, then say no. If you're having sex, be smart and use protection. Respect yourself and protect yourself. For more information, call the National AIDS Hotline at 1-800-342-AIDS 
or log on to www.lifebeat.org. Welcome back to Arrow's Evolution. This is where sexuality and spirituality meets. And today we're talking about comedy. Today's show title is Sex Meets Comedy and Comedy Meets Sex. Well, we've we got Gaylord and he's my new friend in Singapore. He moved to Singapore three months ago from Baltimore and he is the former artistic director of the Baltimore Improv Group and the creator of the four play Sex and Comedy Show, which is a live show in Baltimore and Singapore, which has a podcast following. And the website that you can find him on is 4Play Sex Comedy. That's the number four and Play Sex Comedy. And you can also find him at Facebook at 4Play Sex Comedy. And uh, earlier in today's show, we were talking about how he got into improv and uh, then uh, sex education um, through his podcast. And uh, we were talking before the uh, break that just happened on um, how they tackle heavy topics and also why he feels that people who does improv make for better lovers. If you are not convinced, then uh, let's hear more from uh, Pre Scott right now. Um, so Pre Scott, uh, we we've kind of tackled that part about how uh, people who do improv make better lovers. So what do you, would you have to say about sex educators? Do you think that they also need to be learning improv? I do. <clears throat> I, yeah, I really do think that uh, sex educators, at the very least, know, need to learn a bit about uh, comedy delivery. Um, but, in, you know, in my personal opinion, an improv class is definitely what the doctor ordered on uh, as for sex educators i and here's why and it's a and it, you know all, all due respect but it, we all remember if we did get sex education in school uh I, mm. I have to say a lot of sex education is quite broken the way we deliver it mm. right we take all the fun out of it we take maybe the most fun topic you can think of and we suck all the fun out of it by teaching about it. And, and, and bear in mind, school is really good at that anyway. Like in school, schools have really learned how to suck the fun out of everything. Uh, for, for a lot of years, they've learned how to do that. It, just think back to when you're a kid and what was awesome and fun for you, right? So whatever you were interested in as a child, like the, the world is interesting. Kids all love science. Kids all love stories, whether it's historical stories or fiction stories. You know, volcanoes and rocks and bugs and birds and bats and electricity and all of these things are amazing to kids. Put all those kids in a classroom, make them shut up, not have any fun and listen to you talk about them you have now sucked all the fun out of that thing. And for some reason, this is how we teach sex. Maybe the most fun thing you can think of. So in my personal opinion, we need to learn how to let the fun back in all of those subjects, but notably sex, because it, we've basically failed ourselves at delivering good information to, to ourselves about sex such that now I guess it's good because it keeps you in a job and it keeps me in a job, but we now have to do a whole lot of corrective sex education to ourselves as adults such that we can actually learn some of the things that we really should have learned as we were becoming sexual beings. So in my opinion, if sex education is delivered as, you know, pleasure-based with all the right information uh, and letting it be fun. Like, yes, this is all fun. Here's, you're allowed to have this pleasure. You're allowed to do all of this. I think it could all be delivered in a much better way and retained in a better way and make it so that we don't all have this 
toxic relationship. I say all, but that's not true. But make it so a lot of us don't have a toxic relationship with sex as we're growing up. Um, my sex education, in school anyway, was very well centered around why you shouldn't have sex. And in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at least, that's a lot of people that get that exact same education. Um, we're, we're sort of shown how to put a condom on a banana, and then we're told about all the diseases we can get, and then about how our lives will be ruined if we get pregnant. And then we're sent out into the world. So the message is, mm -hmm. here's yeah. how you put on a condom on a banana uh, that sort of looks like a penis. Uh, we hope you're all heterosexual and you're all going to get sick and die and pregnant if you have sex. Good luck. <laughs> so, and it's such, yeah, we, we don't this find out comedians. Yeah. Exactly right. But as educators, if we took an improv class, if we let ourselves be funny, if we listened to what the class needed and wanted, and if we, you know, were delivering that information <clears throat> and let the wonder and fun of it happen as if we're still kids, I think we could all have a better relationship with sex and sexuality. Yeah. Well, for me, I don't, uh, I, w I don't work with schooling kids. So I, I work uh, primarily with adults and I always try to make my workshops as uh, educational and also lighthearted as possible. I would weave in stories and people would laugh and uh, once we can laugh together then that really helps break down a lot of um, inhibitions and um, so I really get what you're trying to say about the importance of being able to uh, have the fun and the pleasure that is um, part of the messaging and uh, it's funny because you talk about the the sex education that you receive in the classroom and I'm, I keep thinking about the sex education that I didn't receive uh, at all growing up. And it's, um, we get this yearly talk in school uh, from the age of puberty where um, somebody who um, works in a sanitary pet uh, company would come in and talk about how as uh, young women we need to make sure we don't smell down there and so we need to know how to clean our cells and uh, change our pets. That's pretty much Wait. the sex education that I received. Wait, what? So you got, I'm sorry, this is, uh, well, it, it's, it's appalling, um, but also comedy gold. Your, so your, <laughs> wow. Okay, your sex education came from a corporate representative from a sanitary pad company once a year? Yeah, seriously. Every year the, the boys would be told they can go out and play, and every year all the girls had to march into the auditorium and listen to this thing. Wait a minute, so only, okay, wow, so many questions. So the boys didn't even get the education? There wasn't somebody from a no. dumbass razor company or no. something to talk to the boys? No. No, no. It was all the girls. And uh, all okay, the so boys only, would know what they were. Only girls got it. Yeah. Ah, so they let the boys educate but, themselves on the playground, which is a horrible idea. And then they, and the girls all were educated about sanitary pads. And, yeah. and with a little and bit of a little bit of crotch shaming about how they shouldn't smell. So they could that go out and play, and all the girls were punished because we were born women, and then we have to listen to this talk about um, how menstruation happens, and this is how you can get pregnant, and this is why you need to um, be careful, and also don't forget to chain your pets, and. Um, I guess because there was no sex education, um, some kind of sex education is better than no sex education. 
And I suppose that these um, representatives would come in and uh, do it for free because it's to their best interest. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about the brand of course. Uh, here. But that was my sex education. Was it an, and I remember one year um, this religious uh, group came in. Uh, I, um, I'm sure it's a religious group. They didn't say they were a religious group. And so for once, the boys and girls were able to watch this film talking about the horrors of abortion. And then at the end of it, we got like this little, like three centimeter, like little pin that we could pin into on our, onto our collars. And it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a feet, you know, a baby's feet. If you aborted this kid at three weeks old, this is how big the feet would look like. And I wore it for a few weeks because I thought it was beautiful. And then after a while, how morbid it was sung in and then um, how it was fear-based kind of struck me. And uh, then I threw the pin away. Wow. That is heavy. And I think... Yeah, so sex, edu yeah. Yeah. So sex education wow. is quite different now I think, in Singapore. We do have... Um, we do have... Um, better messaging i'm hearing students have it but i also have we also have the ministry of education here saying um hey uh we are going to be more abstinence based now and i'm like what are you what do you mean more abstinence based that's pretty vague but anyway that's the state of how sex education is singapore um it's it's more than what i had it's definitely not sex positive um, even as a sex educator, I'm not even touching it with a 10 feet pole. People who have um, gone into schools to teach are religious groups and um, highly, highly um, scrutinized. I don't, I, I mean, even as a sex educator who's passionate about sex education, I don't really want to put myself in that position of being scrutinized to the extent of um, possibly losing my practice. So yeah, it, um, so I thought... Uh, yeah, so we have a break and we'll, we'll come back and talk more about this. This is pretty heavy, you know? Um, so more after this. Yeah, break. I'm gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna go into the break and ponder pin-based sex education. <laughs> Foot pin-based <laughs> education. the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio, your conscious lifestyle on steroids. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Come heal yourself. What is healing? Healing is nothing but connecting with your all-knowing higher self that already has solutions to all your problems and is always there to guide you. Through this show, we help you to connect with that you are and tap into that innate potential you have to transform your life and fly high. Please join me, your host Monica Goyal, every Sunday, 7 p.m. Pacific. Namaste. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. And to not blame the victim. It's on us. To look out for each other. To, to not look the other way. way. It's on us to stand up. To step in. To take responsibility. It's on us, all of us, to, to stop, stop sexual, sexual assault. assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org.
and this is Martha, and we are on Arrow's Evolution, talking about the link between sex and comedy today. We are with Free Scott Gaylord, and he is with the Four Place Sex Comedy dot com, and he is former artistic director of the Baltimore Improv Show and the creator of the Four Place Sex and Comedy Show. Just before break, we started to talk about sex education that he received, and I started to talk about the sex education that I received. So we got cut off because we went into break, so I wanted to get, uh, let uh, let you, uh, please, Scott, have the opportunity to uh, add your comments um, where we were cut off. Yeah, I was mostly flabbergasted. You made the, you made the improv comedian uh, speechless with your description of what your <laughs> sex education was like. Uh, which was based on sanitary pads and uh, baby foot pins, which uh, <laughs> yes. I, I guess what what it goes to show is that, you know, there's good reason for us to try and step up uh, sex education in a number of ways in a lot of countries. Uh, we, we have a long way to go. And uh, my my little bit of the world, my little take on it is, is uh, that we can? Is that it's much better if we figure out how to add a little comedy into the education uh, in a number of mm-hmm. ways. Uh, but then uh, you and I were also talking at the break. The converse of that is, I also think we have a responsibility as comedians and entertainers in total to get the sex mm-hmm. education correct. Uh, so, mm. you know, it's not just the responsibility of educators to, to learn comedy. My opinion, it's the responsibility of comedians to learn the sex education as well. Yeah. Because comedians are, comedians are observers of the world. Comedians, mm. you know, in the U.S., there's a, there's a U.S. senator who got his start as a comedian, a writer for Saturday Night Live. His name is Al Franken. Um, the the fact is, you know, a lot of people get their actual information from shows like The Daily Show and the and the Colbert Report and and now all of the all of the other shows that The Daily Show has spawned uh, that are you know public affairs shows. And it, so comedians have a responsibility to not get the get the information wrong. So if you know they need to to make sure that they know what sex positivity is and what feminism is and what body positivity is and what the you know what the correct uh rates are for STIs if they want to make STI jokes what the correct pregnancy rates are for you know using various methods if you're going to make a joke about that it's very easy and lazy to make jokes based on tired gender stereotypes or, um, you know, old school thoughts about sexuality, but it's much better comedy if you get the information right and then, you know, insert comedy from there. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really agree because I think um, what's really challenging is reaching out to adults because people who have left the school system um, don't have as much access and would not uh, knowingly and consciously seek out um, sex education and information. So even learning about sex education or learning about sex through comedians or improv shows is an opportunity for them to perhaps reflect on things that they wouldn't otherwise, whether it's um, say for sex or, or anything really around sex, because um, there's a lot of inaccurate information out there as well. And I would really hate for, um, like you said, comedians um, getting this information wrong and making people more confused. Yeah, or having people believe just things that are wrong um, which, which happens, uh, if, if you want to know a famous instance of that, um, we give them a little bit of a break because it happens so early in the, in the uh, HIV AIDS crisis. But, uh, if you listen to it, when I was a kid, probably the biggest comedian, uh, in my younger years was Eddie Murphy. And if you listen to his album raw, 
which is very funny. Uh, I'm going to ignore the, the homophobia he does at the top of that album. But the I think it's raw. It's either raw or delirious. Uh, someone can go check me on that. But he gives basically wrong information about how AIDS is spread uh, mm-hmm. in his set. And he makes jokes, and what he says is something to the effect of, oh, uh, yeah, women have gay friends, and they, they come home with the AIDS on their lips from giving them a peck on the cheek, and they come home, and their, you know, then their husband gets AIDS. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, frankly, dangerous. And I realized at the time we didn't have all the information about HIV and AIDS. Uh, I think the first AIDS clinic was opened that year, so going to give him a little bit of a break on information because, you know, we didn't have the internet then we didn't, we didn't have good ways to spread information. But I mean, imagine doing something like that today. That is, that is a very dangerous bit of information to spread about, you know, the wrong information about how uh, a sexually transmitted infection is spread. And yes. I would say very we still do that sometimes. Yeah, we still probably give some wrong information when we do uh, when we do comedy because it fits the joke better. And I would mm-hmm. say if you if you do look at shows like The Daily Show and all the shows that The Daily Show has spawned, I, I would say they make very certain to get the news information correct, and then they make comedy from there, and it's better comedy. And I think you can do the same thing with sex education. Get the information correct. The comedy will be better once you base it on actual information. Mm. Agree. Okay, so I want to ask you this uh, last question because on every episode we always explore the link between sex and spirit. So what is your opinion of the link between sex and spirit? Is there any link for you? And um, it, it doesn't need to be like a politically correct or scientifically researched thing, i just might like to hear like what you feel is the link between the two. Well, I know when people have sex, they certainly say a lot of spiritual things. Usually, <laughs> oh God, oh God, yes. Yes, oh God, right there. So there must be some link because that's what people are shouting. No, you know, I don't know. I feel like we, you know that I want to honor people's experiences in that. Uh, For me, I feel like, you know, we've wandered away from my expertise. I'm not uh, truly a spiritual person, I would say. I try very hard to be supportive and honor everybody's experiences um, as much as I possibly can. Um, but as far as spirituality goes, you know, I have, I, much like I wandered away from <clears throat> education and classroom based boring sex education, uh, based on my experiences as a kid, I've kind of wandered away from, uh, any kind of spiritual education that's given by organizations. And I kind of, uh, walk the path myself. Um, and like, like the sex education, I, I kind of prefer the information more science-based and a little less faith-based. But I, I don't want to have that take away from my honoring of everyone else's experience and how they, uh, how they experience faith in the unknown, as long as we don't ignore any evidence-based, you know, anything evidence-based. Mm. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much for coming on to today's show. I really appreciate uh, you waking up at 4 a.m. together with me to do this show. And um, um, all the things that you've shared are in enlightening us about the link between sex and comedy. And also... Um, share with me about your sex education and uh, giving me the opportunity to share about mine. I really um, appreciate you uh, having the time for this and um, listeners who are uh, interested to find out more about what Prescott does, please go to his website, fourplaycomedy.com. That's the number four, play, 
sexcomedy uh, sex com, and uh, you can find him on Facebook and as well. Yes, go ahead. One. Oh, I was just going to say, and anybody in Singapore, uh, Martha is a gem of a sex educator in Singapore, and you should go and take as many of Martha's classes as possible. And I just wanted to say, it's yeah, it's wonderful you're here doing good work. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, Prescott and I have become friends over the last few months. Uh, he's been coming for some of my workshops, and uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know him more. And I'm very, very grateful to have somebody who uh, is a lot more uh, sex educated and sex savvy, who understands um, my work. Um, it can be very isolating. And for those of you out there who are listening to today's uh, show, uh, do uh, reach out to me. Drop me an email. Let me know how I'm doing with this show. If you have any feedback, comments, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, who else I should have uh, come up on this show? Uh, let me know. So in the meantime, uh, have a good week and uh, help me to spread the show and send this uh, show. Uh, let your friends know and I'll see you again next week. Bye. Bye, everybody.